If history proves anything, it proves that in ancient times, India was the richest country in the world. The fact that she has always been the cynosure of all eyes, Asiatic or European, that people of less favored climes have always cast longing looks on her glittering treasures, and that the ambition of all conquerors has been to possess India, prove that she has been reputed to be the richest country in the world. Her sunny climate, unrivaled fertility, matchless mineral resources, and worldwide exports in ancient times helped to accumulate in her bosom the wealth which made her the happy hunting grounds of adventurers and conquerors. Strabo, a Greek historian in his book, describing the location of India, and calls it the greatest of all nations and the happiest in lot. Arnold Herman Ludwig Heeren says, India has been celebrated even in the earliest times for her riches. The wealth, splendor, and prosperity of India had made a strong impression on the mind of Alexander the Great, and that when he left Persia for India, he told his army that they were starting for that golden India where there was endless wealth and that what they had seen in Persia was as nothing compared to the riches of India. William Finch, who came to India in 1608, first described Hindu temples as pay gods, which are stone images of monstrous men fearful to behold. He mentioned the temples in Ajmer, three fair pagodes richly wrought with inlaid works, adorned richly with jewels. Domingo Pays has left a valuable account of the great Hindu kingdom of Vijayanagar. He saw outside the city very beautiful pagodas. The chief among them was the temple of Vitalazamin, which was begun by Krishnadeva Raya. Edward Terry, the chaplain to Sir Thomas Rowe, King James's emissary, described the temple of Nagarkot as most richly set forth, both scaled and paved with plate of pure gold. The wealth of the temples stirred Jean Thevenot's imagination, and he wrote of the temples of Benares and Puri, that nothing can be more magnificent than these pagodes, by reason of the quantity of gold and many jewels, wherewith they are adorned. An idea of the immense wealth of India could be gathered from the fact that when Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi destroyed the far-famed temple of Somnath, he found such immense riches and astonishing diamonds cooped up in the single idol of Shiva that it was found quite impossible to calculate the value of that booty. India was the home of diamonds and other precious stones in ancient times. Periplus says that the Greeks used to purchase pieces of gold from the Indians. Nelkinda or Nelisarum, a port near Calicut on the Malabar coast, is said to have been the only market for pearls in the world in ancient times. The pearls presented by Julius Caesar to Serbilia, the mother of Brutus, as well as the famous pearl earring of Cleopatra, were obtained from India. Another cause of India's impoverishment is the destruction of her manufactures as the result of British rule. When the British first appeared on the scene, India was one of the richest countries of the world. Indeed, it was her great riches that attracted the British to her shores. The source of her wealth was largely her splendid manufactures. Her cotton goods, silk goods, shawls, muslins of Dhaka, brocades of Ahmedabad, rugs, pottery of Sindh, jewelry, metalwork, lapidary work, were famed not only all over Asia, but in all the leading markets of Northern Africa and of Europe. What has become of those manufacturers? For the most part, they are gone, destroyed. Hundreds of villages and towns of India in which they were carried on are now largely or wholly depopulated, and millions of the people who were supported by them have been scattered and driven back on the land to share the already too scanty living of the poor Riyadh. What is the explanation? Great Britain wanted India's markets. She could not find entrance for British manufacturers so long as India was supplied with manufacturers of her own. So those of India must be sacrificed. England had all power in her hands, and so she proceeded to pass tariff and excise laws that ruined the manufacturers of India and secured the market for her own goods. India would have protected herself if she had been able by enacting tariff laws favorable to Indian interests, but she had no power. She was at the mercy of her conqueror.
The region that today comprises the Indian subcontinent held the largest share of the world's gross domestic product until the beginning of the 16th century, when it was rivaled by China, and then again throughout most of the 18th century. At the end of the 16th century, India's great wealth sustained a population of more than 100 million people. From the early 18th century until the beginnings of the 19th century, when India enjoyed a 24.4% share of the world's gross domestic product, economic historian Paul Bayroach conforms, the region enjoyed a 25% share of the global trade in textiles. It was the world's leading manufacturer of handicrafts and handloom textiles. More important, there was a large commercialized sector with a highly sophisticated market and credit structure, manned by a skillful, and in many instances very wealthy commercial class. Methods of production and of industrial and commercial organization could stand comparison with those in vogue in any other parts of the world. India had developed an indigenous banking system. Merchant capital had emerged with an elaborate network of agents, brokers, and middlemen. Its bills of exchange were honored in all the major cities of Asia. In conclusion, we can say there shouldn't be any question about the richness of India. India was always rich and India will be rich in the future again. So next time when you say India is a poor country, you should think twice, because this unique country is poor because of all the loots and colonialism, otherwise India would have been the richest country on earth. It will rise like a phoenix bird from the ashes again. It will spread its greatness and its unique culture all over the world in the near future.